Hey, remember when I told you I was going to automate my surface grinder? Well, we're going to actually start making some chips today. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. A few weeks ago, I started a project to automate my surface grinder using ClearPath servos and a ClearCore motion controller. In the first video, we talked about the overall plan, scanned the entire machine into a CAD model, and used the CAD model to select and roughly position the motors and drive components. If you haven't seen that video, you should. It's a good one. Since then, I have spent many, many hours in Fusion 360 figuring out all of the details. The first batch of laser cut parts is already back from send, cut, send, and today we're going to fire up the lathe and mill and start making the other parts we need to make this plan a reality. This old Tony famously said that all great stories start at the lathe, but I disagree. I think they start in CAD. This is the CAD model that we looked at last time we looked at the surface grinder project. Last time we looked at this, I had just placed the motors into space so that I could figure out how they were going to fit and kind of modeled up roughly the belt drives so that I could order components, but this time I've actually got all the mechanics in place to actually mount these. So the plan is to have a laser cut quarter inch aluminum plate across the front of the saddle here to hold the X motor and the Z motor, and then to have another laser cut plate up here on the top for Y. To model these parts, I kind of do this in a two-step process. I start with a construction sketch. So if we look at the saddle front plate here, this is the construction sketch that I created. And I had the motors already placed. I had all the drive components already placed. So I just put a sketch on the plane where this plate is going to be mounted and then constructed everything that I need. I projected geometry from the motors to create the slots. I projected geometry from the screw hole locations that I determined from the scan to put holes in for that and then drew an outline around it that I felt would give me enough clearance and enough meat in the part to mechanically support everything that it needs to support. And so then that sketch I used to extrude the plate. So this is just a very simple, simple, you know, selection of the region in the sketch and extrusion. And then after that, I came back and did things like fillets, like this corner was square in the sketch, but I put a fillet in here and I rounded all the corners and kind of smoothed this stuff out and did any other operations on this that I needed, like placing threaded holes to get this into its final form. Then I came back and created a new sketch on the surface of the plate to use for a DXF export. So here is the saddle front plate DXF export sketch. And all I did is just put a sketch on the front, just projected the entire surface. And that brought out all of the geometry for all the cuts, the openings for the motors, the openings for the slots, the screw holes, the perimeters, everything. And that gives me a sketch that then I can just right click on and say, save as DXF. And that will give me the DXF file that I need to upload to send cut send to have this part cut. I did exactly the same thing for a plate up here for the Y motor. Now in this case, there's a little bit more geometry that's needed. This spacer, there is a spacer that is on the machine right now, but I need to make a different one that's a little bit longer. It has some screw holes and has the geometry for mounting this plate. And then the plate of course has the mounting points for the motor. Then in addition to just the plates for the mounts, I designed these nut plates that go on the back. Because of the way this is gonna work, I need a screw to come in from the front and ride in this slot. So I can't put a threaded hole in the plate here, and the holes in the motor are not threaded, so I need to put nuts on the back. And if I put individual nuts back here, then I'd have to use two wrenches, and I'd have to mess around with them. I would drop a lot of them, and they would roll under the machine. But this way I can design this little plate that has two threaded holes in it. I can put one on the top, I can put one on the bottom, and then I can just loosen the screws from the front and these will stay in place and allow me to adjust the motor and retighten the screws. So I designed one of those for the uh, NEMA 23 and then another one for the NEMA 34. So I have both sizes and I can do exactly the same thing, create a DXF export sketch and buy as many of those as I want. 
Now, in addition to just modeling the plates that I need, I also went in and modeled the bearing assemblies and the hardware that's going to be needed to adapt these pulleys. So if we come in here and look at the Z shaft, for example, we have the shaft here that is in the machine right now, and then an adapter piece that's going to be necessary to adapt the pulley to fit onto that shaft. Because these shafts have these hollows in them for set screws to bear and the pulleys don't have the right amount of meat in the right places, I'm going to have to make a number of these adapters. In fact, they're different for every axis, so I'm probably going to have to make a separate adapter for each axis. And in this case, there's actually a screw through the front of this that draws the shaft out and puts compressive forces on the inner race of the bearing to preload it. So there's a lot of complexity here. We're probably not going to get into that in the shop today. But I went ahead and modeled all of that out so that I know that the system that I'm designing is going to fit into the space available. And then I also went ahead and designed some covers. I definitely do not want a big powerful belt drive hanging out of the front of the machine here where I could get caught in it. So I designed a cover for that and this is just a 3D printed part that fits over the front and secures with three screws. Same thing up here for Y just designed a simple cover and in this case that cover is going to capture the plate that'll get it aligned and then there's a single screw to hold it on. For all of the parts I went ahead and created a set of drawings. For these laser cut parts I'm not going to actually machine them which is why there aren't really any dimensions on these but I do have call outs for the holes where I need to machine countersinks or where I need to machine threaded holes. Or if you have this done by send, cut, send, this ends up just being a reference for me so that I know what to order. And for the parts that need to be machined, I have complete drawings with dimensions so that I can machine the parts. Send, cut, send graciously agreed to sponsor this build with laser cut parts. Don't tell them, but I probably was going to order the parts from them anyway. I just took the DXF files that I exported from Fusion 360 and just uploaded them here on the Send, Cut, Send website into my parts library. Then once I had that, you can just pick an individual part, click Add to Cart, and then select how you want it made. In this case, I want metals, I want aluminum, I want 6061T6 in quarter inch or 6.3 millimeter thickness. I can change the quantity and just click Next. Now there are additional operations that they can perform. They can do countersinking, which I'm going to do manually. You, they can do tapping, which I'm going to do manually. And the reason I did not order these parts with that work already done is that it adds a couple of extra days to the processing time. And I wanted to get these parts as quickly as possible because I stupidly thought I was going to be able to complete this project in December before I had surgery. That didn't work out for a variety of reasons. Click next here and they also have finishing options, deburring, tumbling, anodizing, powder coating. And again, I opted not to get any of this done because I wanted the parts as quickly as possible. Now there are some limitations like some of the smaller parts I think are too small for the tapping or the powder coating service, but that stuff changes over time. So you'd have to try it with your parts and see what they can do. I only need one of these, so I'll just go ahead and click Add to Cart, and then I'll go back and do exactly the same thing with all of the other parts that I need for the project. To make the bearing clamp for the Y-axis, I'm just using a hunk of 1018 steel from the scrap bin. I wanted to use 1144 because of the way it cuts, but my supplier didn't have any in the right sizes. 1018 is often difficult to get to cut and break a chip properly. And you can see this is just throwing off these long spirals that are flying everywhere. I don't like that, but generally you can clean this up just by tweaking some of the cutting parameters. Speeding up the spindle helped a little bit. These chips are still a little bit unwieldy. We'll just take a measurement here after the first pass, program that diameter into the DRO, and then from there I can just use the DRO to work down to my dimension. Now I've increased the feed per revolution a little bit and here I'll bump it up a couple of more points and that is now starting to get to a chip that I can deal with. See we're getting these little C curls that are popping off and they're falling right down on the guard there on the lathe and not flying up into my face. And you can see the color of those is looking pretty good too. They're kind of gold. They're not really starting to turn blue or purple. So for a carbide that's a pretty good chip color. That's 
probably about as fast as we can remove material with this small lathe. At least this type of material with this tool. That's looking pretty good. Now we get the part down to the correct external diameter, we'll switch to working on the inside. Now for drilling, I've always used the tailstock, but I've been playing around a little bit with this multi-fix collet holder. And I got to say, I am really enjoying this. This was sent to me by Pee Wee Tools just to try, and I'm loving it. Once you get the DRO set up so that you know where the center of the part is, you can just put your drills in the collet holder and you can just push them in. And more importantly, you can pull out rapidly for peck drilling operations which is something that's very difficult to do with a tailstock, at least with my tailstock, because you either have to unlock it with a nut and a wrench, or you have to wind it all the way back out to lubricate the drill. So having this so that you can drill with the carriage makes life a lot simpler. Now I went all the way through the part with a small drill first, and then I'm working up to the largest drill that I have, which is a half inch, and then switching to a boring bar. Now for this boring operation, there's not a lot of room in there, and this is a pretty big boring bar. It doesn't really clear the chips very well, and so that's part of the reason why I wanted the hole all the way through the part, so that the chips have somewhere to go ahead of the bar, but they still wrap around the bar and try to wedge down between the bar and the near side of the hole. I really need to grind some relief on this boring bar, find a better one, but you know, it'll do. It's what I have for now. Then for the final passes, you can see that I angled the multi-fix tool post in by one notch. That's enough to give me more clearance on the boring bar and I can still reach to the depth I need to reach to make the part. And so that relieved a lot of the pressure, kind of changes the cutting angle on the tool. It's not ideal, but it will work. Now I just went down to dimension using the DRO by taking a cut, measuring, and then setting the DRO and using that to drive to my final dimension. And that actually worked pretty well. Now this is just a clearance, it's supposed to be 22 millimeters, but again, it's just clearance, so it doesn't really matter. And I'm within a couple of hundredths of a millimeter, so that will be just fine. We'll face it again, just so that I can get a clean zero on the DRO. I'll make a little mark at the depth for the shoulder that you can't quite see, and then we'll just whittle this down. And I don't have the speeds and feeds quite right. This machine's howling and making a lot of noise. But if I just take light cuts and just work back and forth, it removes material pretty quickly and I can get down to the dimension I need for that shoulder. And then we'll take the final pass all the way down to the correct diameter and then traverse across to clean up the face of the shoulder there. And then some chamfers just so that I don't cut myself. And that is the machining on this side of the part done. Now to cut it off, I'm going to use a cutoff tool. I'm just going to align the edge of that with a scale to the edge of the part. Use the DRO to go over to the correct dimension and just part it off. And I'm parting it a little bit long so that I can come back and face it. Now parting on this lathe is a mystery to me. It's something that I've not quite figured out a reliable recipe for. In the past, I've used high-speed steel cutting tools, and they seem to work okay. I'm probably going to go back to that. I've been playing around with this carbide cutting tool, and it does pretty well as long as you get into the cut and you stay in the cut and keep the cut going. If you let it rub, you get a mess, and if you bite a little bit too deep, bad things happen. Now usually this explodes the tool. I actually did this a couple of times on this part and the tool survived and the edge is still clean, but I decided not to push it in a part this big. I just switched to the saw. And then after a few seconds of sawing, I decided, yeah, that's not going to cut it. I took it over to the band saw. Oh, not going to cut it. Well, okay. I'll just pretend I intended that pun. So I've got it flipped around in the chuck and I'm just facing off the other side. We'll take it to length using the same technique of just going back and forth until we get it down to the correct dimension. Put on a couple of chamfers and the turning on that part is done. I did do a 3D printed prototype because uh, 3D printing is cheap and fast and it allows me to check the fit on the machine and this seems to match the 
3D printed prototype pretty well. I will take it. The turning's done on this part, but now we need to put some holes in it, and to do that, we'll take it over to the mill. This is just a couple of aluminum soft jaws that I made for my four inch vise on my other mill, and I've just been using them as V-blocks to hold round parts here. Just set this in on top of a couple of parallels, get it clamped in place, and then get rid of the parallels so that we don't drill into them. Now the quickest way to get centered up on a part is just to grab a tool that fits down into the hole, but without too much space, and you'd be surprised how close you can get just by eyeballing it. And then once we get close, I'll bring out, of course, the dial test indicator and zero this out and set the zero, zero point of my DRO on the center axis of the part. And then from there, I can just program the bolt circle in my DRO and then just drive around to the holes. Now, I actually set this up for six holes instead of three. And so I'm just hitting the forward button twice to skip over one of the holes. And that gives me an easy way to put in three holes and then come back later and put in three more holes in the spaces in between. So in this case, I need three through holes with counter bores. So I start with a spotting drill, get that point established, and then come back and drill all the way through. Now, since this spacer is thicker than the original one that is on the grinder, I opted to go with deeper counter bores instead of longer screws. But in any case, I'm just going to start by using those spots and continuing around the bolt hole pattern. If I just keep advancing, it'll just keep going around the circle. And I'll just go around and around and just drill these holes all the way down to depth, which is all the way through. And then I'll swap to a piloted counter bore, bring this down and touch it, zero my quill DRO, and then just use the DRO on the quill to counter bore these down to depth. I do have the mill in back gear so that it's running slower. So you have to run the motor the opposite direction because the back gear has an extra gear in the train that reverses the direction. But this is just a simple matter of using the quill to bring these down to depth. Then we'll come back and clean those up with a countersink just to take the sharp edge off of the corner. Now I've changed the diameter on the bolt hole circle because these holes are a slightly different diameter because I designed it that way. Um, there were, were reasons, but I don't remember what they were. And we'll just come back through. Now these are going to be tapped holes. They don't technically need to go all the way through, but I'm drilling them all the way through just to make the tapping operation easier. Because the hole goes all the way through, I can use a pilot, or excuse me, a spiral point tap, which will push the chips ahead of the tap and out the bottom of the hole. Where if I didn't have that, I'd either have to hand tap them or use a spiral flute tap that pulls the chips up and out. And power tapping with a small spiral flute tap can get a little sketchy sometimes. It's really easy for those chips to jam and so you can get to depth, but then when you try to back out, the tap jams and breaks. And I just find it so much simpler to use a spiral point tap, also called a gun tap, because it just shoves those chips right out the bottom of the hole. And those are the threaded holes complete. Now, where the holes broke through on the backside, there are burrs, so I'll just come back with this little Noga rotary countersink and just clean those up. And that's the part complete. This looks a lot like the one that's on the machine right now, except it doesn't have a flat side and it has those extra threaded holes and it's a little bit thicker. And the parts are back from Send Cut Send. Big thank you to Send Cut Send for sponsoring this project. They provided these parts for free to help support the channel. And they even sent me Sour Patch Kids. They do that in every order, that's not special. Got the nut plates here for the NEMA 34 and NEMA 23 motors. I'll just need to thread those because I opted not to have them do it. Got the plate for the Y axis. That looks good. All these aluminum plate parts have a little bit of a brushed finish. They do have a little bit of a burr on the edge. And so I just went over them with a Scotch Bright pad on a right angle die grinder and that cleaned them right up. But in general, I generally plan on using the aluminum parts just as they come without any further finishing. I do have the cover here for the x-axis. 
And while the cover I showed a minute ago for the Y axis, I was able to print on any printer I own. The cover for the X axis is so big, I printed it on the Prusa XL. It's really the only printer I have in my fleet right now that can accommodate it. There are lots of ways you could choose to hold these parts at the mill, but I'm gonna do what I think is the easiest thing. And that is to use this aluminum mini pallet. And you can see there's a great big scar in this thing from a screwed up CNC job. So I don't feel bad about drilling a big clearance hole through it. And then I'm just gonna leave the mill centered over that hole. To locate the holes in the parts, I'll just put a gauge pin that closely fits the hole in the chuck and then bring it down, line that up with the part and then clamp the part in place on the mini pallet. And now I can perform operations on that hole because I know I'm lined up with it and I can do it very, very quickly. In this case, I had these holes laser cut to the correct pilot drill size for the tap I wanted to use. So I can just tap these directly with no further operations on them. And you can see that lifted slightly. I probably should have two clamps on this part. I didn't break the tap though. Maybe I got lucky or maybe it was skill. Now the holes in this plate are a little bit bigger, so I'll just grab a larger pin, locate the hole, and then come back and tap it. Now that large hole that I drilled in the mini pallet underneath provides clearance all the way through for the chips from the tapping operations to push through the hole and out the bottom without getting in the way and without interfering with moving the part around for subsequent holes. So I'll just move it around for each hole, run the tap through, and this part is done. Get the tap out of the way before I start moving stuff around so I don't snap it off. You don't want to do that. Ask me how I know. And there are the holes. Now on all of these little nut plates, I'll do exactly the same thing. But since these are so much smaller, I'll get rid of the can't twist clamps and just use the little mini clamps for my mini pallet system. And we'll just do the same thing. So after doing several of these holes, I decided it was not worth swapping to a pin in the chuck, that the tap itself is going to get me close enough to the hole, and that worked just fine. So line it up, clamp it down, and run the tap through. Now in the wide motor plate, I need to countersink these three holes. I'll switch back to the pin to locate it, use a strap clamp to hold it down, bring in the countersink and just countersink these. At least that's what I would have done if I had spec the holes the correct size. I actually had them too small in the DXF file, so I had to drill them out first, run those down, check with a screw, pull it out with a magnet, and this part is done. Except they're actually countersunk on the wrong side if you look closely, so I will be coming back and fixing that later. Let's put some parts on the grinder. This is the crank for the Y-axis, raising and lowering the grinding wheel. And this is just held on with two set screws. Loosen those and pull off the handle. And then there are three counterboard socket head cap screws that hold this bearing clamp on. Now this clamp actually has a little shoulder on the back and the purpose of that is to apply pressure on the outer bearing race to hold it in place. I don't really think there's much preload on this, but I duplicated that geometry on the new part. So it will fit in there and we'll just use the same screws and put this part back on. And once again, I opted to make the counterbores deeper so I could use the same screws rather than having to get longer screws to make this work. Now with that block on, we can mount the plate. Of course, this is how I countersunk them, but that's backwards, so I flipped the plate over and countersunk them again. Fortunately, there was enough meat to make that work. Maybe next time I do this, I'll pay more attention. I actually paid pretty close attention to which side I was supposed to do them on, but I somehow flipped the part over by the time I got it to the mill. I probably should have written it on the surface of the part with a Sharpie to make sure I didn't screw that up. Now I opted for countersunk screws here just to help locate this plate and make sure that it didn't shift around in operation. And the motor fits on the back here. You can see I've got slotted holes and I can put the screws through, but you can see the screw goes through a slot in the plate so I can move it up and down. But the hole in the motor isn't threaded, so we'll put one of these nuts behind it, 
and thread the screw into that nut. Then I can put one in the other side. And now I don't have to hold anything while I tighten or loosen these because they stay in place because the two screws go through the same nut plate. I'll repeat, put one more on the bottom here. And now the motor's free to move up and down. We'll just put it in the middle of the travel. I don't have the belt with me right now. And we'll just tighten that down. Now the question is, how rigid is this? I figured quarter inch aluminum would be enough. And yeah, that is going to be plenty. It's just pressure pulling these shafts together that's ultimately going to affect it. It should be plenty strong for that. I still need to bore out the pulleys and make the adapters for them. We'll be doing that in a future video. But I do have the cover, so we might as well put that on. One screw goes through there, and that goes into the hole that we tapped. And I have this set up so there's a couple tenths of a millimeter of preload, so it actually sort of flexes the cover and holds it tightly on the plate. And that looks good. Looks almost like the machine was designed for that. Almost. That's one axis down. Let's get the plate on the front of the saddle for the other two. And again, the handle for Z here is held on with two set screws, but it's also held on with a preload screw that goes through the end of the crank. We'll get that out and then the handle should come off. Now that handle is a part of the preload system on the bearings. We will have to duplicate that geometry. I'm going to take the pointer off of this, but there's no need to take that spacer off. It's not going to be in the way. We're not mounting the motor to it, and it needs to stay there, again, as a part of the bearing preload system. Now for X, we have the same two set screws, but again, the way the shaft is retained and the way the bearings are set up in here is different yet again. We'll have to you know, make the right adapters for the pulley there. Now I'm going to use the screws that are used for these little covers in order to hold the plate on. Perfect. Those are M6 screws and the plate should be designed to fit on there. Now the far left hole is the only one that's round. So I will put that one in first and that will locate the plate left and right. And then the other three holes are slotted. They're about a quarter of an inch long. It's just enough to provide a little bit of wiggle room in case the dimensions on the machine are not exact or in case I didn't get the scan perfect or something. These are M6 screws, and yes, I did say they were, you know, they were a quarter of an inch long. Yeah, it's my world. It's where I live. Okay, with the plate on, let's grab the NEMA 34 motor for X and fit that in. And unfortunately, the register on the motor does not fit into the part. I left a little bit of additional clearance here just to make sure that there was plenty of space. Apparently, I did not leave enough but I can fix it. I can fix it in the CAD model so that the files that you, know, you download if you wanted to do this and if for some reason you had this machine would fit, or I can just you know, grab a round file here and clean this out. Now, I ran my fingers over that and discovered that they are very, very sharp after filing. Go figure. A little Noga deburring tool takes care of that and now the motor fits perfectly. Same drill here. Put the nut plate on the back, one on top, one on the bottom, running four screws. And now we have adjustment for adjusting the belt tension on the X motor. I'll just put that in the middle of the travel and tighten those screws down. I also have the pulleys that I'm going to use here. These are five millimeter pitch belt pulleys, uh, unlike the three millimeter pitch that we had up there on Y and what we'll have on Z. But again, I need to bore these out and make the shaft adapters so that they will fit properly. But I do have the cover here. Might as well test the fit on that. And what do you know? The CAD model worked and the holes all lined up. Nice. Now we just need to mount the motor for Z. And this does not actually go through the front plate, so we need some spacers. Specifically, we need three spacers. I'm going to make these parts over here at the lathe in the collet chuck, and I'm going to use a 5C collet stop. This just screws into the back of the collet. I can put my part in the front and then adjust the depth of the stop so that it's resting against the back of the part. 
and that gives me a repeatable position. I can take this part in and out and always get it back in the same place, or I can put multiple parts all in the same place. So I'll start by just taking all three of these parts and facing them off. Now you can see that my camera has decided to focus on those chips in the tray in the back. I mean, it's got a very nice clear 4K picture of those chips. If that's not what you wanted to see, well, I guess that's just too bad. That's what the camera decided to focus on. So I'll just run all three of these spacers through. These are just half inch aluminum round. And once I get one end faced on all three parts, I will put them back in. These parts are just, the stock was just slightly oversized, so you can see me struggling with the collet here. But I put that in with the clean face against the end of the stop in the collet. Now I can pull it out, measure the part, and set that dimension into my DRO. Now I can put the part back in again against the stop, and then I can use the DRO to face it to the proper length. And that is very, very close. And then I can put the other parts in one at a time against that same stop. Now, because this is a pull in collet, if I tighten the chuck tighter or if the dimension of the stock is a little bit different, it won't be perfect. But for this application, it will get me within a couple of a hundredths of a millimeter, which is plenty accurate for this operation. Now I'll take the stop out because now I need to drill all the way through the parts and I will just put these back in and pre-drill them the tap size for the threads that I need to mount the motor. I believe it's M5. Now I want the hole to go all the way through, but I'll drill halfway through from one side, flip it around, and then drill through to meet the hole from the other side. That will give me maximum concentricity out at the face, but still give me clearance all the way through. And then for power tapping, I'm using the same spiral point tap that pushes the swarf ahead of the tap and I'll just tap it about halfway through, maybe just a little bit more, and I'll flip it around and do that from both sides. You can see here the chips that it pushed ahead of the chat of the tap, they're still there in the hole, and you can just pull them out. So where the threads kind of overlap in the middle, they might be kind of messed up, but I should have clean threads on both ends of the spacer that are plenty deep for this application, and that is all I need. And the speed call it Chuck makes quick work of this. It'd be quicker if the material weren't oversized, but there are our three spacers. The reason there are three spacers instead of four is because the fourth spacer would interfere with the belt, but three spacers is going to be plenty for the rigidity that we need. I'm starting by just mounting all three of the spacers on the motor, and I started out trying to use a washer on the back, but it kind of interferes with the casting. And so I wasn't able to do that. It will be fine. And when I do the final installation, I'll put some Loctite on them. But for now, I'll just put this together dry. Actually, technically it's not dry. They're still cutting oil in the holes. So with the three spacers on the motor, I can then mount it to the front plate. Again, with just four more M5 screws with washers. Now this puts the motor at the correct depth, or, or more precisely, this puts the motor as close to the back of the saddle as I can get it. And I put it within about three or four millimeters in the CAD model, and it looks like we're pretty close to that. This is a three millimeter hex wrench, and it will fit behind the motor. And this is a four millimeter wrench, and it will not. So what do you know? Once again, CAD works. Now I've got the pulleys to go on here, but again, I need to make the adapters. You can see that as I turn this shaft, it's actually screwing in, and that's because the bearings don't have their preload on them because I don't have the handle with the end screw that's actually putting the pressure on that. So we'll have to replicate that geometry when we make the adapter for the pulley. Now that is the motors mounted. There's other stuff that still has to go on here. I probably want to close off the top of this at some point just to, you know, close off all the mechanics here. I think I want to put the controls over here on the right hand side. I'm not totally sure. We also have the stop assembly. If I end up with limit switches, I'll replace that with some kind of a limit switch assembly. 
but I think I want to put a touch screen over on the right and maybe a jog wheel. You know, there's going to be swarf and liquid coming off of the grinding job. So I have to be a little bit careful with that, but I think we can make it work. And then up on the top with the Y motor, you will note that I haven't interfered with any of these ribs down the side. That's where scales would go for a DRO. It'd also be a great place to put a DRO display for the automation system. So I've still got all of that space reserved and we'll just have to figure out, you know, what fits and what works best. If I have a weakness, and I'm not saying that I do, it's that I tend to spend a lot of time in the thinking and planning phase of a project. And that doesn't make compelling video because it looks a lot like this. The good news is that if I ever get to the actual building part of the project, I have enough preparation to make it look like I actually know what I'm doing. As usual, the CAD model for this project is on Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects, join the discourse forum, and get a little peek behind the scenes. And if you're already a patron, thank you. You make it possible for me to do this. Thank you for watching.